Okay, so uh, today is going to be the second part of um, the processes and equipment used in metal casting. And as usual, uh, just a brief recap of the main points of the previous lecture. So we've said that casting processes can be classified into uh, three categories. And this classification is mainly done based on the type of mold and the patterns that are used to create your metal casted parts. So based on that, we can have an expandable mold and a permanent pattern. In this case, the mold is only used once as the pattern that gives shape to your part can be used several times to produce several parts. And an example of this type of casting processes is sand casting, where the mold is normally made of sand or a mix of sand with other materials that we've seen also in the previous lecture that can be used, for example, to improve the mechanical properties of your uh, molds and therefore uh, achieve a much better accuracy in terms of the parts that you're casting, but also to have a better control over the thermal properties of the molds and therefore on the type of grain size and geometry that you obtain and as a consequence of that on the mechanical properties of your parts. If you have both the mold and the pattern as expandable, so in other words, uh, only used once and then uh, we get uh, rid of it, then in that case, you uh, may be using uh, an investment casting uh, process. And we're going to be talking about investment casting uh, today. Another type of casting processes is the use of permanent molds, like die casting. And in this case, uh, we have a mold that is normally made of a metallic uh, material where all the features of the mold, including uh, the running channels, the rises, everything is machined in the mold's cavity. This is also normally an automated process, as we will see today. And this allows for um, a much higher production rate but also because of the properties of the mold, because of the properties of the materials that we use to build our molds, we can build parts with much uh, better accuracy, but also much better surface properties. So these are the three types of um, casting processes and some examples of those specific uh, casting processes that you need to know. But we've also mentioned uh, the different types of uh, mold features, uh, especially in terms of sand casting. And you need to know what are those features and very importantly, what is the function of each of those features? So in this example of sand casting, we have a flask that uh, in very simple terms is just like a frame that holds the mold together, especially the cope and the drag. So the bottom and the top parts of the mold. These two uh, parts of the mold is normally separated by the parting line. And as we will see in the next lecture, the position of this parting line is extremely important, important depending on the type of material that you are using to cast your parts. The pouring basin, the sprue, the runners, they all make part of the channels that are used to conduct the material into the mold cavity. Uh, very importantly, and as we've seen in the previous lectures, these sprues are normally tapered to avoid aspiration and uh, the generation of defects. And we can use both the Bernoulli theorem and the law of mass or flow continuity to design these uh, tapered sprues. In terms of the vents, it's extremely important that we uh, account for the inclusion of these channels. They are normally used to extract any gases that are either transported during the flow of the metal or generated inside the uh, channeling system due to the melting of your uh, material. And they need to be extracted because they can have a detrimental effect in terms of the mechanical properties of your parts by, for example, uh, giving rise to uh, porosity. The core 
uh, if you have all the parts or cavities in your uh, parts, so in the part that you are uh, casting, we normally place these cores within the molds. These are left inside the molds during the solidification, and they're only extracted when you open the molds and retrieve the parts. And this is different from the patterns because the patterns in sand casting, they're only used to create an imprint of your parts and they are removed before placing uh, the core um, inside the cavity of the mold. The risers, uh, they are extremely important as well in terms of metal casting because they allow us to uh, compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that normally occurs during uh, the solidification process of your metal. There are different types of risers. Uh, as you can see here, you can have an open riser uh, or you can have a blind riser. The most common type of risers in sand casting are the open risers. The difference between them is that the open riser is normally in contact with the atmosphere and they are much more easy to include in your uh, molds. The blind risers have advantages in terms of the control of the temperature uh, to guarantee an adequate flow of the metal into the mold cavity, but they are much more difficult to manufacture and to create uh, inside a sand casting mold. Uh, also, in terms of the risers, uh, you also need to have in mind that we need to control very well the solidification time of the metal to ensure that uh, the metal is in a molten state during the solidification of your casted parts. So the solidification time of the metal inside the riser needs to be higher when compared to the solidification time of your parts to ensure that we have metal in a fluid state to flow and compensate for the gaps that are left due to the shrinkage of your parts. So these are the features and also the function of the different features that you need to uh, know. We've also mentioned that we can have different types of patterns depending on the complexity of the part that you are uh, building. And in general, the patterns are used to mold uh, the sand mixture uh, into the shape of the casting that you want to create. And we can use different types of materials to create these permanent patterns. They can be made of wood or they can be made of plastic or even uh, metal. Uh, they can be designed with a variety of features to, specific, uh, to, to fit a specific application and also according to the economic requirements of your project. So the one uh, piece pattern that we also call uh, loose or solid patterns, these are generally uh, used for very uh, simple shapes. And when you want to create uh, a small number of parts, and these are the ones that are normally made of wood. Um, and because of that, they're also quite inexpensive when compared to other types of patterns that can be used in sand casting. The split patterns. So these are two piece patterns uh, made in a way that each part forms a portion of the cavity for the casting in the cope and in the drag. And because of that, we can create more complex shapes when compared to the one piece uh, pattern. The match plate is also very similar to the split patterns. Again, you have two uh, uh, pieces of a pattern, but different from the split patterns, they are assembled into a match plate and they are fixed in, in this match plate and then placed in uh, the cope and in the drag. So the bottom and top house of your uh, mold. And again, one of the advantages of these match plate patterns is not just the complexity of the parts they can create that is higher when compared to one piece, but also uh, the accuracy and resolution because uh, they are fixed in a plate, which allows uh, for um, a better um, reproduction of the shapes that you want to produce. So these are the key points of the, of the last lecture, and uh, it's important that you know this information.
Today, we're going to talk about the different, uh, the other two different processes in terms of metal casting. We're going to start by looking at permanent molds and some of the most important features of these uh, metal molds. Uh, we're going to look also at the different types of die casting processes uh, that can be uh, either hot chamber die casting or cold chamber and the difference and where they normally apply depending on the materials that we are casting. And then we're going to be looking at the expendable mold, expendable pattern, uh, or in other words, the investment casting process where the mold and the pattern are only used once to create our parts. And then uh, just to finalize, uh, but also uh, very importantly, how can we inspect casted parts for either superficial um, or internal defects that can arise during uh, the manufacturing of your metal parts. So in terms of the permanent molds, one of the main differences is the type of material that you use to build your mold. And in this case, they are normally made of metals. And as we've uh, discussed in the previous lecture, this gives us significant advantages, not, term, not just in terms of the accuracy of your parts, but also, and very importantly, in terms of the properties of the parts that you manufacture. By having this type of materials, metals, you have a much better control over the solidification process, and you can promote a, a much better or a quicker solidification process, which gives rise to much finer structures, which, uh, as a consequence, improve uh, the strength of your parts. So. Another important difference uh, when compared, for example, to sand casting, as we've seen in the previous lecture, is that all the features of the mold are manufactured inside the mold using, for example, CNC machining. So in this case, the runners, the cavity of the mold, everything is manufactured or is imprinted inside this mold using uh, CNC machining. The only part that normally is not directly manufactured in the mold cavity are the cores. So the cores are normally manufactured uh, independently. And then if needed, if required to create cavities, they are placed and fixed inside uh, the mold cavity. Uh, because these molds are permanent and they are used to create thousands uh, of parts, uh, it's, it's very common in order to increase their life, uh, to coat the surface of the molds with uh, refractory uh, slurry, such, for example, as sod sodium uh, silicate or clay. And this normally uh, sprayed on the surfaces, and this allows for an extension in terms of the life of the molds by reducing the wearing and um, also by allowing a better demolding of your parts. And because this is uh, um, a fully enclosed mold, so you have two parts of the molds that are close together, after you cast your parts, you need to be able to retrieve it. And as die casting is normally a fully automated process, what happens when you open the mold is that you have the automatic ejection of your parts from the mold cavities. And this is normally done by placing mechanical ejectors. So uh, normally uh, these are uh, pins that are located in different parts of the mold that once the mold is open, they force the parts to be ejected, obviously without damaging the part. And this is normally done after the part is solidified. So this is a typical example of a die casting uh, machine. Uh, there are different sizes and the size of these die casting machines normally um, vary according to the size of the parts that you want to inject. So the larger the parts, the higher will be the pressures that you need to apply to the mold, uh, to the metal, to make it flow into the mold cavity. And that will normally determine uh, not just the size, but also the cost of these uh, machines. Uh, in this case, uh, you have a movable parts. So the mold is divided into parts, again, the cope and the drag. 
and they are clamped together by mechanical means, normally using uh, a cylinder. The process is normally used for uh, low melting uh, points uh, materials, such as, uh, for example, aluminium, magnesium, and copper alloys. Uh, and as we've seen uh, also very briefly in the previous lecture, this type of molds, this type of die casting process uh, allows us to uh, create parts that in general presents a very good surface finish, but also very close uh, dimensional tolerances. Uh, on top of that, you can obtain a very uniform and good mechanical properties because of the control you have over the solidification process. And because it's a fully automated process, you can uh, increase the production uh, rate. Uh, just to mention that on top of having um, the molds that it's normally made of metal materials that uh, per se allows for a better control over the solidification process, you can also introduce in these molds a refrigeration. So you have a refrigeration um, liquid uh, or circuit that runs around uh, the mold and allows you to extract uh, the heat that is um, leaving the mold in a much controlled way. And this uh, actually allows you for um, an enhanced control over the solidification uh, process. So just to help you visualizing the die casting, as we said before, we have two halves of uh, the molds. Uh, these are normally clamped together by mechanical means. Uh, normally one part is fixed and the other part is movable. You have a barrel that contains the molten metal and this metal flows into the cylinder and then is pushed by mechanical means uh, to the inside of the part of, of your mold. By having a refrigeration system, you can cool it down and once solidified the mechanical ejectors, push the parts. And then the only thing you have to do, similar to the sand casting process, is to remove all the uh, channels by cutting them using, for example, CNC uh, machining. Uh, the die casting process was uh, initially developed around um, the 1900s. Um, and the European term, as, as usual, is different from um, uh, our more uh, British term to classify this process. It's normally called pressure die casting. Uh, as we've seen in this, in this video, and as you have also represented here in this figure, in the die casting process, the molten metal uh, is forced into the cavity of the mold at pressures that normally range from 0 0.7 to 700 uh, megapascal. And there are two types of uh, die casting machines. The hot chamber, uh, which is the one they have represented here, or uh, the cold chamber. And there are some important differences in terms of these two die casting uh, machines. In the hot chamber process, this involves the use of a piston, normally an hydraulic uh, piston, which forces the required volume of molten metal into the die cavity through a gooseneck and a nozzle. The pressures range up or can range up to uh, 35 uh, megapascal, but in average they are uh, around 15 megapascal. The metal is normally held under pressure inside the mold until it completely uh, solidifies. Uh, as we uh, seen in the previous slides, to improve uh, the life of the dye and to uh, ease or, or to facilitate the cooling of the metal, uh, we normally use uh, a system um, that contains or, or that allows for the flow of um, a liquid to extract the heat from the mold and speed up the solidification uh, process. <clears throat> uh, 
Also, uh, this specific hot chamber casting uh, process uh, is normally used for low melting point alloys, such as uh, zinc, uh, magnesium, tin, or uh, lead. Uh, and the reason for that is because the furnace that is used to melt your material is attached to the injection system. So different, for example, from sand casting, the furnace where you melt your uh, material is not separate from the injection or the casting uh, system. They are normally together. And because of that, this is normally used for low melting point uh, materials. In a different way, uh, in the cold chamber process, the molten metal is poured into the injection cylinder. So this means that the metal is normally melted using a furnace that is detached from your injection system and then pour directly into the injection uh, cylinder of your uh, machine. The chamber is not heated and the metal is forced into the die cavity at pressures uh, usually around 20 to 7 uh, megapascal, although uh, sometimes they can reach pressures as high as 150 megapascal. There are two types of configurations uh, for the cold chamber. They can be horizontal, where the cylinder is horizontal, or you can have uh, the vertical uh, system. This cold chamber is you normally use for high melting point uh, materials. And the reason why it's used for high melting point materials is because the furnace is detached from the injection cylinder. And this allows you to uh, set up much higher melting point uh, materials without the risk of damaging your injection cylinder. So, in terms of the properties and the applications, uh, obviously you don't need to know all of this in detail, but there are some important uh, information that you need to uh, retain. In general, independently if it's a, a cold or hot chamber process, the die casting has the capability for the rapid production of very strong, high quality parts with, um, you know, quite generally high complex shapes. And this happens because it's fully automated, which is different from uh, sand casting. And the high quality and complex shapes arise from the fact that we use permanent molds. And because we use permanent molds that are made of metals, that allows us to produce parts with very good dimensional accuracy and also very important good surface details. Uh, which means that this allows us to decrease the production time because you don't require, you don't need to actually uh, go through a post-processing stage to eliminate any surface defects or to improve the surface quality of your parts. Because in, in general, uh, the pressures involved are very high. This allows you to, to manufacture parts with very thin walls, normally about 0.38 uh, millimeters or even thinner than that, which is almost impossible for other processes where, uh, for example, in sand casting, the uh, injection of the material happens at atmospheric pressure. So here, because you have a cylinder that forces the material into the mold at very high pressures, you can actually manufacture very uh, fine walls or very fine details without the risk of, for example, premature freezing or incomplete filling of the mold. And this is a clear advantage of the process of die casting. So, are there any questions regarding um, this process before we move into uh, the investment casting? Sir? Yes. So, uh... Uh, I would have uh, three questions. Okay, and let's just, would, let's, yeah. so I'm sorry. 
let's just make one for the sake of time and then uh, we can cover the other ones um, at the end of the lecture. Is that okay? Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, good. So can we send cast the permanent molds? If we can send cast permanent uh, molds, well, you could potentially uh, do that, but because you really want to have a very, um, you want to have very fine details in your, in your, in your mold. And this is normally achieved using um, CNC machining. And on top of having, uh, of wanting to have these very fine details, one of the problems of, of sand casting is that you normally don't obtain a very good surface finish. And one of the, the, the reasons why we use die casting is because it allows us to obtain parts with a very good surface finish and very fine details. So using sand casting to create the molds for die casting would not be advantages because uh, we would be um, creating molds that would not allow us to obtain the parts with the detail, the accuracy and the surface uh, finishing that we normally require uh, using die casting. So although possible, it wouldn't be um, feasible uh, or at least advantages uh, when compared to CNC machining. Right, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, so moving on uh, in terms of investment casting. So as we've seen during the classification of the process, this is generally classified as expendable pattern or expendable pattern, expendable uh, mold, or probably as more commonly used as lost wax process. It is a, a unique uh, process in a way that both the mold and the pattern must be uh, produced uh, for uh, the metal casting process, and they can only be used once to create the parts that you have uh, designed. Some of the typical applications of the investment casted uh, parts are cylinder heads, engine blocks. Uh, you can also uh, build crankshafts or brake components. So a lot of different components for the automotive uh, industry. Uh, in terms of the different steps, and just to illustrate why this is called a, wa a lost wax process, is because the pattern is normally made of wax so you need the first step you need to create a mold uh, where you can cast your wax and generate your pattern or multiple patterns once you generate your multiple uh, patterns you then can assemble them on a, a tree once they are assembled then these patterns made of uh, wax are coated with a slurry and uh, they can be coated several times until uh, you obtain uh, the desirable uh, thickness for this uh, specific coating. Once the mold is completely coated, still with the wax pattern inside, what we normally do is to place this in an autoclave where we uh, increase the temperature and we melt the wax patterns and this is then removed leaving behind only your mold cavities. With the mold cavities formed and without any wax, the next process is to uh, melt your material and pour it inside the mold cavity, where you have all the different sprues that will conduct uh, the material into the different mold cavities. After that, the process is similar to any other of the process that we've seen before. Uh, the solidification of the metal will occur. And once complete, what happens is that you break the mold and then you retrieve your casted parts. And again, these casted parts will then need to go through an inspection. You also need to remove all the gating systems, all the runners. Uh, using, for example, CNC machining, uh, similar to what happens in sand casting or uh, die casting. And uh, after completing the inspection of the parts, then they are ready uh, in terms of the process. So just for better 
visualization um, of this uh, investment casting process. The first step, as we've seen before, we need to create our mold where we cast our wax and obtain our multiple patterns. These are then assembled in a tree and coated with a ceramic slurry that ultimately will give rise to your mold. So after that is completed, we place it in an autoclave and the wax is removed uh, by melting it. And then you end up only with the mold cavities that you fill in with the molten metal, allow it to solidify. And once completely solidified, the mold is broken and you can then retrieve your uh, individual parts. So as you can clearly see from this process, and for example, when compared to sand casting, you can actually uh, increase your production rate because you can have multiple patterns assembled in the tree, uh, thus allowing you to uh, build multiple patterns at the same time using uh, the same mold. So although you can only use it once, you can create multiple parts using uh, the same mold. And this obviously increases the production uh, rate. And also when compared to other processes, uh, because of the materials of the mold, that in this case uh, can be, for example, a ceramic slurry, uh, you can obtain uh, parts with a much better uh, accuracy when compared with uh, other types of, of, of metal casting processes where the mold is made of sand and therefore um, gives rise to uh, parts with lower uh, geometrical and dimensional accuracy. Independently of uh, the process that you use, there is also there is always a stage where you need to inspect for different defects that can arise because of the casting process. As we've seen in some of the previous uh, lectures, these defects can be either superficial defects or they can be internal defects. So defects that cannot be detected at naked eye or using optical uh, microscopy, for example. So in the case um, that you have surface defects, the most common technique to uh, investigate uh, the presence or not of these defects on the surface of your parts is using uh, liquid penetrance. So in a very uh, simple way, what uh, is normally done, once you obtain your cassette parts, this is normally uh, cleaned and dried then the liquid is placed on top of the surface of your cassette parts. The excess of the liquid is then washed, removed. You allow it time for the liquid to penetrate. And then you use a developing agent to uh, reveal the defect that is present on your uh, part. Just very similar to uh, the common uh, developing agents that I use, for example, in photography. Not exactly the same, but a similar analogy. So, and with this technique, if the defects are not uh, internal defects, if they are small or relatively small defects on the surface of your uh, cassette part that cannot be, be detected by naked eye, you can easily uh, evaluate their presence and in case that cannot be uh, corrected, then the parts is uh, discarded. However, if you have, for example, internal defects, uh, for example, as, as porosity that can develop uh, due to uh, entrapped gases or shrinkage, we need to use other techniques to uh, evaluate the presence or not of these defects. The most common technique is using a computer tomography based on X-ray. And this allows you to evaluate the presence, uh, but not just the presence, also the size and the shape of uh, internal gaps uh, in your uh, parts. In case you have developed uh, porosity and depending obviously on the, on, on, on the level of the, of the porosity, this can be corrected using or by placing your cassette parts 
uh, within a isostatic uh, chamber and then by raising the temperature inside this chamber and increasing the pressure you can compact your parts uh, obviously up to a certain level that will not compromise the dimensional uh, accuracy and the tolerances of the parts and you can eliminate the porosity if the if the, the if the porosity level is uh, very high then at that point the part needs to be discarded and you need to go back uh, and uh, address this problem by changing uh, the process parameters of your uh, metal casting for example the rate of flow of the metal or by for example increasing the mechanical properties of your uh, molds or uh, the design features of your mold and uh, just to summarize today's lecture in terms of the permanent molds they're normally uh, made of metals uh, importantly uh, in terms of differences when compared to the other processes all the features of the mold including uh, the runners all the channels the mold cavity all of this is manufactured and imprinted in the mold okay uh, we have two types of uh, permanent uh, mold processes in terms of uh, die casting they can be hot chamber or cold chamber uh, and the difference is the presence or not of a furnace attached to the injection cylinder depending on if you have this furnace attached or not you can actually use different types of metals with uh, different types of melting points also uh, another technique the investment casting this is classified as expandable mold expandable pattern because the mold and the pattern are only used once but although uh, only used once we can produce multiple parts by assembling the uh, wax patterns on a tree and in this way we can incre increase the productivity uh, by assembling and casting these multiple parts in terms of the inspection this is critical stage in terms of metal casting because different effects can uh, arise during the, the the process they can be either surface or internal defects if they are surface defects they cannot be detected uh, by naked eye we can use liquid penetrants to reveal those defects if they are internal defects like porosity we can use x-ray computer tomography to evaluate those defects and apply the correction um, actions that are uh, adequate to eliminate or to compensate for those uh, defects so uh, remember that these are uh, some of the most important points things that you need to uh, remember and also again please remember that this Thursday we have a tutorial please remember to check your group numbers and also the link for zoom sessions okay if you have any questions uh, or if you can't find your group please do feel free to contact me and um, I'm now happy to answer any questions that you have okay <laughs>